So this business of how long people who are alive today may live all began in, I'm going to say, something like 2002. So I had come up with the idea of comprehensive damage repair and convinced myself that it was feasible back in 2000. And then in about 2002, a Dutch journalist named Theo Rickel contacted me and asked me how long I expected to be the life expectancy, the average lifespan of people born in the year 2100. And it turned out that he was asking this question to every gerontologist that he could get hold of. Anyway, long and short of it was, I said, well, probably about 5,000. Um, essentially what I was doing was I was taking the assumption that by then we would very probably have defeated aging to the extent of staying one step ahead of the problem, this methuselarity thing, and that therefore the risk of death per year needed to be presumed to stay the same, however long ago somebody was born. So if one looks at the risk of death today in early adulthood, then it's very low. If you reach, let's say, the age of 26 in the Western world, then your chance of not reaching the age of 27 is less than one in a thousand. And that number, of course, is going to decline because we're going to get better at stopping people from dying in other causes like car accidents or whatever. So I thought, well, OK, let's throw in a modest factor there. And, you know, 5,000 is a pretty conservative number. So that's the number I gave. I still stand by it, absolutely. I think that it is extremely likely that people born today will, on average, live to 1,000. I think there's at least a 50-50 chance that your average person who's 30 years old today will live to 1,000 but not because we are within a couple of decades of completely being able to repair all damage, only because we're within a couple of decades, with, the, with reasonable probability, of course, of getting to this methuselarity point where we're staying one step ahead of the problem. Now, the interesting thing about this is that it has caused an enormous amount of waves in two different communities in two different ways. The... Um, well, the reason it dominates my public profile is, first of all, because somehow or other the media is terribly fixated on longevity, despite however often I say that longevity is simply a side effect of health, right? You don't stay alive without staying healthy, and this just seems to pass people by. They much prefer to focus on the longevity aspect. The other reason why it's been a problem is because my colleagues within the field, people who study the biology of ageing, are desperately petrified of being associated with such numbers. For two reasons. Number one, they feel that such numbers make their field sound like science fiction, which they feel is, you know, uh, likely to hinder their ability to get public funding for it. Number two, they feel that it's utterly unjustified scientifically. And of course, from the point of view of the biology of ageing, it is indeed absolutely unjustified. I would never deny that. What I'm doing when I'm talking about the achievement of the methuselarity is I'm talking about comparing the progress that typical technologies make after some initial breakthrough is made. So I'm saying, yes, I think we can reach the methuselarity by particular ways, to do with actual biology as we have it today within the next couple of decades with high probability. But I'm absolutely not saying what ways we will subsequently use to keep ahead of the curve. I'm just saying that technologies tend to keep ahead of the curve and therefore that it would be absurd to pretend that that's not going to happen. And my colleagues never deny this. They never say, oh, this is actually wrong for this specific reason. They just don't want to have anything to do with it. They just run away very fast. 